All right, let's get started. I'm, Al I'm Alice Chen. I'm a pediatric dental faculty with Rosemary University College of Dental Medicine. Um, we operate two dental clinical practices here in the Valley, one in Henderson and a Morang New Clinic um, here in this very building up on the third floor. Um, we offer a full range of dental services, including same day crowns, dentures, implants, and wisdom teeth extraction. Our pediatric dental department is staffed by two board certified pediatric dentists, including myself. Um, in our Henderson location, we also have a building that is dedicated to orthodontics. Um, the fees for all of our services are about 50% compared to private practice setting. Um, our time together today will be split between pediatric dentistry and then um, innovations in general dentistry given by Dr. Thacker. Um, after we are done, for those of you guys who have an extra few minutes to share with us, we would love to show you um, our clinic up on the third floor. So with that, um, let me turn the podium to Craig. Good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. I'm Craig. I am uh, the sponsor for the Collect Kind of Credit Union. We sponsor Roseman's Neighborhood Health Series. We're very proud to do that. We are the medical filled credit union. Uh, that said, anybody can join the credit union, but our core field of membership are policemen, firemen, medical, but of course, anybody can join. We do everything a bank does for each, you know, we have checking, savings, loans, all that great stuff. One of the great things about us versus a bank is we are not run or owned by shareholders like banks are. We are owned by our membership. So at the end of the year, when we make a profit, we don't keep it. It doesn't go to the board of directors. It doesn't go to the CEO. I've been working with them for 29 years. And no matter how many times I ask, they won't give it to me. So we give it back to the members. That's millions of dollars every year that go back into our members' accounts. There's a magazine on the table out front. Don't wait for the movie to come out. It's a really good read. So if you have any questions, just check that out. And if you ever want to join the credit union, you can join online over the phone, or you can come into one of our full service branches. Thank you guys, everybody, for coming out and enjoy tonight's presentation. All right, and on behalf of Roseman University, thank you, Craig. Thank you for the lovely dinner. Um, so a little bit about myself. I got my psychology degree in undergrad from UCLA, um, went to Boston University um, Dental School for four years, and um, I wasn't someone who really knew what I was getting into when I went to dental school. Um, it was at the end of my second year, beginning of third year, when they started putting us in different clinical rotations. When I entered pediatric dentistry, I immediately fell in love with it. Um, so right after I graduated from dental school, I did a two-year residency in Philadelphia and um, worked for a year. Um, in my late 20s, I moved to Las Vegas. Um, I met my husband on Match.com. Um, both of our kids were born in Summerlin Hospital, and we actually live right here in zip code 89135, and Las Vegas has been our home ever since. Um, my journey with Roseman University started last year, and so far it's been very, very amazing, and um, I'm happy to be here with you guys tonight. Um, before we start talking about baby teeth, I also volunteer with Hearts Alive Village. Um, my volunteer side is in the PetSmart location right on Charleston and Qualify. So if you, for any of you that go to that location, um, if you see me cleaning cat litter, scooping cat poop, please come by and say hi. So with pediatric dentistry, Whenever I tell people, especially um, my friends who are general uh, dentists, that I'm a pediatric dentist, and they just always make a face. Nobody really likes to think about pediatric dentistry. Um, I've even had patients' parents who would ask me point blank, and this has happened several, several times, um, why in the world would you pick the most unpleasant specialty within the most unpleasant profession? And when most people think about kids going to the dentist, this is what they think about. So super, super scared, um, probably a bad idea to stick those scary poking instruments right in her face. So I don't blame this little girl. We're crying, we're scared. Maybe we need a mommy, a daddy or a caretaker to hold her hand, sit with her instead of just letting her stand alone in front of the dental chair. 
And this little child is just horrified. It would take a lot of effort and patience to get him to calm down. Um, it's a challenge. And now we have someone like this. Um, we're kind of in the tantrum stage, um, super, super scared. Um, so why, why, why do we do this? Um, what makes pediatric dentistry really, really fun for me is that we just always have to be ready for any kind of behavior. Um, with clinical experience and thorough open discussion with parents and the kids, we really try our best to find comfortable ways to deliver care and at the same time, give the child the best experience possible. And for me, that is why I am passionate about my field. So in our short time today, we're going to cover three topics, um, early dental visits, why we wanna see kids early. And this is going to be very, very specific to infants and toddlers. Um, early decay intervention, there are amazing things that we can do now to treat cavities when they are at the very, very beginning stage, instead of drilling into the teeth um, and surgical interventions. And people are always freaked out about taking x-rays on little kids. So I'm going to go a little bit into that too. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry states that every child should have the first dental evaluation soon after the first baby tooth comes in and no later than the first birthday. So for those of you in the audience who are parents, how many of you actually brought your kid to the dentist before they turned one? Don't, you're, you're great. You get an A plus. <laughs> you're the only one. But the rest of you, don't feel guilty. Um, this is the official recommendation, but in real life, most families don't actually bring their kids in until they are about two or three. But this is our official recommendation. And of course, the reason why we have this guideline is, as we all know, cavities, really, really bad cavities can actually start from a very, very early age. So we want to get kids in. Um, when we see super young children in the clinic, um, what I usually like to do is I sit down with the parents and we have a discussion first. And the reason why I do this is if I lay the kid down, start poking in their little mouth with my big fat fingers, scary instruments, if they start to get upset and start crying, I don't want myself and the parents and the guardians to become so distracted that we forget to talk about certain topics that might be important. So I like to get all the talking out of the way first. And in our Henderson location, we actually have a cute little corner where we have little toys and little books. And a lot of times I will actually encourage the kids to continue to play in that area. I will sit with them, sit right next to the parents and we have a thorough discussion about everything before we actually do the dental exam. So a list of topics that we address, um, oral hygiene. Who is brushing the toddler's teeth? Um, if you tell me that your one and a half year old does a great job brushing three times a day, I'm gonna be a little bit doubtful. Um, at that age, um, the adult should be the primary person to um, perform the home care. And of course, when we actually do the exam, I take a closer look if um, the child has plaque accumulation here and there, I try to show the parents exactly where I see the plaque and how to address those areas better. Nursing and bottle feeding. So um, right now our academy recommends weaning bottle feeding and nursing at the age of one. Um, I would imagine that this guideline is going to change very soon. I don't know if um, any of you guys have read that last year, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually changed their guideline. Now they want kids to be breastfed until a minimum of age two and up to whatever age they want, as, as long as um, it makes the kids happy and the parents happy. Um, I don't know how I personally feel about that, but um, we usually um, tailor our dental guidelines according to what the pediatrician are um, recommending for their patients. So I'm assuming that we're probably going to change our guidelines soon. Um, diet, sugar intake. Most people are well aware that we shouldn't be feeding little kids soda all day long. Um, juice is a big one. 
So a lot of people give their kids juice and our recommendation is no more than four to six ounces a day. And when you think about it, that's very, very little because a small juice box already has what, probably six or seven ounces. So if the child has one during breakfast, then that's it for the day. I tell parents that if your child really likes one um, juice, you can water it down. If you do half and half, then you can give it twice a day in um, four ounce servings. And then of course, sugar. We all know about candy, but these days um, people get really confused about fruit snacks and we, we all know what those are, right? Okay, so when I was little, fruit snacks used to be located in the candy section in the store. Do you guys remember that? For those of you my age and older, um, nowadays fruit snacks are, a lot of them are made by organic brands. So um, I think Costco sells uh, Welch's and they're shaped like little fruits. They look pretty healthy. On the packaging, it actually says, um, you know, vitamin C added, super healthy. Um, Auntie Annie's, which is a very popular organic brand, um, they make fruit snacks too. And those are very, very popular. Um, but I try to remind parents that fruit snacks are neither fruits nor proper snacks. They're essentially candy and they're no better than gummy bears. Fluoride exposure. Um, we want everyone to start doing fluoride as early as possible. Um, obviously at a very young age, however much toothpaste we put on the toothbrush is going to end up in their little tummies. So for infants and toddlers who are not able to spit, swish and spit yet, we recommend about um, half a grain to one grain of rice. That's the amount of toothpaste we should be placing on the toothbrush. Um, we do that so that they get the benefits of daily fluoride exposure. Fluoride makes the enamel stronger, harder, less prone to decay, but as such a small amount, it's not going to do any systemic harm. And then teething symptoms. Um, again, for those parents who are in their 40s and 50s, how many of you guys remember the Highland teething tablets? Did you? Okay, those were great, right? Yes. Um, Clark County is fluoridated. It, it has that, um, but we do recommend um, topical fluoride too. So about 20 years ago, let's say if it's determined that you are at high risk for developing decay, um, a lot of people, a lot of pediatricians, as well as pediatric dentists will actually prescribe extra fluoride, little fluoride droplets. Now, because we have so many great topical products that we can use, um, we are starting to shift away from doing the fluoride drops and rather just relying on the very, very low dose fluoride in our water system and topical products. So that, that's a great comment. Um, Flor Clark County has been fluoridated since the 70s, I believe. Um, so teething symptoms, um, the Highland teething tablets, it turned out that they worked so well because they contained um, the toxic ingredient belladonna. So pretty much, you know, you put it in their mouth, they get so nauseous and they, they fall asleep and they don't cry anymore. That's why they work. So we don't recommend any kind of teething, um, teething tablets or teething gels. And um, we look at tongue tie, that, that, that's a big hot topic these days. Um, lip ties and tongue ties can be associated with difficulties in, in nursing. So we do look for that. And then um, airway anomalies, huge tonsils, possible sleep apnea. I, I actually had the experience um, of helping one of my patients and it was um, inadvertently. Um, so I, I saw this child and then it was COVID. And then a couple of years, saw them again. And then there was a baby sister who was a new patient. And, you know, I was looking at the baby sister and the parents started talking to me about sleep apnea, how I really, really helped them with the baby. And I was like, what are you talking about? I've only seen your older child. I've never even seen your baby. And they were like, no, Dr. Alice, you don't remember. Before COVID, she was a newborn. And, you know, you had some extra time. So even though she wasn't an official patient, you looked in her airway real quick and you told us that her tonsils were abnormally large and they subsequently brought her to an ENT. And, you know, I was able to, you know, help them resolve a, um, a lot of sleep apnea problems. So that was a very rewarding experience for me. 
And finally, um, prevention. So I really try to spend a lot of time talking about prevention. And in pediatric dentistry in particular, it, it really is 95% diet. So um, a lot of us, we think when little kids get cavities, it must be because they're not brushing enough, they're not flossing enough. In real life, it really, it, it's mostly diet. And the reason why those of us that work exclusively in pediatric dentistry know that is the kids that we see who end up with significant, cav significant cavities are not really the ones with poor oral hygiene. A lot of times their oral hygiene is excellent. They're great brushers, um, but they're always the ones who have a lot of candy soda or juice. On the other end of the spectrum, there are plenty of kids where we see them every six months and then their oral hygiene is always horrendous for some reason. And sometimes those kids never get a single cavity. So it's really mostly diet. Any questions so far? All right, um, so infant oral exam. So after we discuss all the topics, um, you know, if some infants and toddlers are actually really, really happy. So we either have them sit on the dental chair by themselves or I have little babies sit on their parents' lap and show them little, little instruments. Um, we use a technique called tell, show, do. We talk about the instruments first we show them how they work. I usually show our little poker in our mirror on my own fingers first before I put it in their mouth. And um, you know, when you guys go to the dentist, there's that instrument, it's like a little poker on one side and a big poker on the other side, super, super scary. So um, in our practice, um, we actually have a one-ended poker and I hide the sharp area in the palm of my hand. So when I'm showing the instrument to the young child, they're just seeing, you know, the dull end. And I showed them that it's a little counting stick or a magic wand, super, super non-invasive. And then when I'm actually doing the examination, I do this um, turn of hand and I magically use the sharp end of the instrument in their mouth. But by the time that happens, I'm kind of under their eye view, so they don't even see that. Um, Lap to lap exam, it's um, the picture that we see on the right. So for kids who are a little more timid, who, needs, um, who need a little more support, what we do is we have the child sit on the parent, facing the parent. Um, I sit knee to knee with the parent and then we lay the child down. And I love this position because as I am looking at the teeth, looking at the oral hygiene, checking for plaque, looking at this and that, I can actually simultaneously show the parents exactly what I'm talking about and what I'm looking at. So we're on the same page. It's a wonderful position and it's very, very safe. Um, the kids usually feel pretty secure. Um, that is not to say that a lot of times the kids are just screaming and crying the whole time. Then we just do the exam really, really quickly. I sit the child back up, calm them down. Then I talk to the parents about exactly what I see. And um, at the end of that examination, usually I will spend some time talking about what to expect over the next six to 12 months period. Um, so this first visit is actually very, very thorough. It takes a long time. And, um, but the time investment is really worthwhile for me because it makes the following subsequent visits much smoother and easier because I would have already jotted down the topics that we need to talk about with the specific family. Um, early decay intervention. So we all know about fluoride mouthwash. Um, pretty much for all my patients above age four who are able to swish and spit, I have them use a fluoride rinse. Um, the prescription toothpaste is um, something that we utilize a lot. Um, we'll talk about fluoride varnish, which is an office-based product. And then finally, um, silver diamine fluoride. This is a product that I am most excited to share with you today. Um, it's really, really amazing. So um, the prescription toothpaste, it has three to five times the amount of fluoride. 
compared to um, your average over-the-counter toothpaste. So I frequently prescribe for um, this product to my patients who are undergoing orthodontic treatment. As we all know, with all the hardware in the mouth, it's very difficult for kids and even teens to um, take care of their oral hygiene properly. So the idea is that if we just blast the teeth enamel with extra fluoride every day, even assuming that we're going to see a little bit of extra plaque on the teeth, we probably have decreased the um, chance of developing decay um, significantly. Um, the in-office fluoride varnish is just a simple gel when we catch cavities really early. So if we look at the picture on the left-hand side, um, look at, let me see, oh no. Um, look at like there are four teeth, right? So look at the three teeth on the left side. And do we all see that little chalky white area near the gum line? So that is actually the very, very beginning stage of cavities. Um, the tooth on the right-hand side, you see that little hole in there? It's kind of yellow, kind of brown. That is a decay that needs to be treated. So we try to catch decay at the early stage. When we catch it early like that, um, and then we, a lot of times I ping down the fluoride gel in office and we actually bring the child back instead of every six months for regular visits, we bring the kids back every two or three months. And um, if the parents are committed to brushing, keeping the teeth clean, stopping the bottle or the nursing habits, a lot of times we can actually maintain these teeth forever in these very, very stages in front of our eyes until the teeth are ready to fall out. I have seen plenty of kids where we just cavities, where we just maintain the cavities at this beginning stage for years and years. So it's um, very, very effective. And um, it's a very simple gel. We just brush it on. Very, very quick and easy. And it's usually flavored, um, something very palatable. So kids are not too scared. Um, silver diamine fluoride. So um, first, I have to explain that um, the re part of the reason why this product is so exciting is when people put research and money and time into dentistry, it's, it's never pediatric. Nobody cares about baby teeth. So they spent money, you know, researching about implants, bone graft, whatever. Um, the baby teeth, because you're going to fall out, um, just nobody cares about them and nobody devotes any time and attention. So when this product came out, it really generated tremendous buzz and excitement in the pediatric dental community. And I have to say the best thing about it is that it actually is very, very effective. So it's a clear odorless liquid. It combines the antimicrobial nature of silver and the remineralization of um, fluoride. So it doesn't prevent the decay what it does is when we catch the decay at the very, very early, very, very early stage, we paint this little liquid on the decay itself, and it actually stops the decay from progressing further. It was approved by the FDA in 2014, um, but it was used in Japan for decades already, so has a good track record. I personally started using it in 2016, and it can be applied quickly and easily. And I have um, a couple little videos to show you guys. Um, and it's 80% less costly than a traditional filling. So outside of insurance, um, let's say a two or three surface white filling on any back tooth, we will probably charge, I don't know, 200 and something dollars. Um, when we do silver diamond fluoride, the cost is usually, you know, we charge about $35. So it's very, very cost effective. Um, so they have done a lot of research. We start with two applications, four to eight weeks apart. So let's say if I see a small decay, I would rub it on, bring the patient back in two, in six to eight weeks, and then I would do another application. And then we wait until the six months checkup. We possibly will take a new set of x-rays and evaluate where we're at. If the lesion looks the same, 
sometimes it even gets smaller, then we're very, very happy. If it looks like it's slightly bigger, but not that much bigger, I might decide to do an extra application. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh huh. So I'll, uh, mm -hmm. I'll go back to what you just said, but the major drawback is that it turns the decay, not the whole tooth itself, but just the decay jet black. And we're not talking about brown or dark yellow. We're talking about jet black, like my hair. Um, so going back to your comment just now, it's actually very wonderful and it can actually be used as a diagnostic tool because if a tooth has no decay, you paint this liquid over it, nothing happens to the tooth. The only area that is going to stain black is the area with decay. So it's really, really neat. Um, so let me see, I gotta use my mouse for this part. Okay. So this is an x-ray of a 10-year-old, and I just kind of want to explain to you guys what we're seeing in the x-ray. Um, these two are baby teeth. These two are adult teeth. She has a silver filling here and here. Oh, you guys can't see my mouse, huh? Okay. What? Where is it? Really? Oh, I see it. Okay. All right. Silver filling, silver filling on baby teeth. These two are permanent molars. That's a white filling. Um, so this patient had been to the dentist for many, many years. She became my patient last September when this x-ray was taken. So the cavities are, do you guys see that little, little kind of like a little dark notch? That's the beginning of a cavity. So she has a cavity on the permanent tooth and a small one on the baby tooth. The, the one on the baby tooth, I'm, I'm really not too worried based on her age, based on how I see the permanent tooth is coming in already. This tooth will stay in her mouth for, I don't know, a year, 15 months at the very, very most. So even if this cavity progresses rapidly, nothing's really going to happen. We're gonna leave this tooth alone. But what I'm really, really worried about is this little cavity. So these two teeth are in tight proximity, right? The cavity is already there. Traditionally, before the introduction of silver diamond fluoride, I have two choices. I can be, I can just monitor the small decay and chances are it's going to grow and it's just basically supervised neglect. Or I would have to drill into this tooth um, to treat the decay. And that always breaks my heart. Um, we are not at an age yet where dental restorations last for a lifetime. So I already know that when I put a filling onto this tooth and she's only 10, by the time she is about 20 to 25, she's gonna need to have that filling replaced. Do that two or three times, she'll probably end up with a root canal and a crown on that tooth. So it makes me feel guilty to um, damage this you know, beautiful tooth just for a small cavity. And now we have options. So this is my patient. Her name is Camilla. She is seven years old. So um, again, we have, okay, these are silver fillings. Um, these are cavities. So again, we see that darker area. This is kind of a broken filling. And I want you guys to pay attention. This is not as good of an x-ray. I think she was moving around a little bit, but she has a startup cavity in between that permanent tooth and that baby tooth. So we're going to treat her with a silver diamine fluoride. Um, Advantage Arrest by Elevate, 38% um, silver diamine fluoride. That is the most popular brand in United States. That's pretty much what everybody uses. Wait, hold on. I don't know what I did. I need some help from a, a millennial.
Well, sorry about that. <laughs> So it looks like it's still kind of stuck. I don't know if I should use my mouse. We can do, here we go. So we have already squeezed out a couple drops. Um, this is how we prepare the silver diamond fluoride chair side. Take the micro brush and just um, simply dab a few drops onto the floss and we try to paint it on both sides of that floss. So we prepared um, that same, we do that same preparation for a couple different flosses so we can be ready to go. And so the preparation is as simple as that. Yeah, and we do this, um, we, we prepare it ahead of time and we do this outside of the patient's mouth. So we don't, we try to not make little kids open for too long. And this is um, that same patient, Camilla, age seven. All right, so um, we have the silver diamond fluoride floss and solution prepared already. Um, all we're going to do is isolate the area first. I'm going to use a couple cotton rolls. Um, and again, we're placing it in between this back tooth right here and this baby tooth right here. Just gonna dry that area a little bit. And then I'm going to take my first piece of floss and all I'm doing is I'm flossing back and forth um, trying to get as much of that silver diamine fluoride liquid onto the surface of the decay lesion as much as possible. I'm doing this for about 10, 20 seconds. Yeah, my seven-year-old patient, Camilla, she just sat through two fillings, three sealants. Um, she's still numb on this lower left-hand region. She's very, very well behaved. Gonna get you a couple toys, okay? Ah, or do you want three today? I knew it. Okay. All right. And then, um, unfortunately, silver diamond fluoride has a very, very bitter flavor. So we don't want it to kind of run everywhere in the mouth. So to cover it up, I'm putting a little fluoride gel just kind of on the outside, on the top, and on the inside to seal the liquid in there and to cover up the flavor. Um, the fluoride gel is usually pretty sweet. The flavor that we use here today is um, a very pleasant lemon flavor. So, okay. And that is it. So very, very, very simple and painless. Um, like, like I said in the video, um, by, by this time, she had already sat through local anesthesia, two fill-ins, three seal-ins, and she's still just so super well-behaved. Um, the good behavior comes at a price. Um, so our typical routine is after we see kids, everybody gets one prize. Um, she usually gets three prizes. Um, there has even been times when she, she negotiated for four prizes. So, yeah. So we mentioned before that the liquid turns the cavity jet black. This is how it looks. It's very, very black. So the top picture um, on the right side is the before and left side is the after. And um, a lot of times we, we do this to kind of hold decay over until the child is old enough to cooperate. So if a little two-year-old, three-year-old is crying, there's one cavity, the only way to treat them is sedation, general anesthesia. We're talking about additional costs let alone just more medical risks. Um, we really try to avoid that in pediatric dentistry. So we place a little liquid. We tell the parents, hey, you know what? Let's do this. We'll wait a couple of years. We'll wait until she's five. And then we'll put a real filling in there if that's what you like. Um, I So the lower picture, this is, um, this is not my patient. Um, I try to never put it um, in the front area um, just because of cosmetics, um, it's just, it doesn't look too good. And then, um, when we do it in between the teeth, so all you end up seeing is just a little bit of black. 
So to me, um, it's, it's totally worth it to not having to get a, um, get a filling. Any questions about silver diamond chloride? Um, so the last little topic is um, x-rays. Um, so we try to be really, really careful with kids. We're all worried about radiation. With children, we always use a lead apron with thyroid collar. Um, we are selective. We only take whatever's necessary. And by whatever's necessary, this is not something that we, may, we make up. We follow a very strict guideline. Um, but the most important factor, I think, is going to an office where people, I'm talking about the doctor and the staff, actually really, really know how to work with kids. So they can get a perfect x-ray on the first try instead of having to take that same image over and over again. Um, that really is you know, the best way to minimize radiation for kids. Um, so for kids, um, these kids are probably around three to four years old and I love looking at x-rays. Let me see if I can get the mouse over. Okay, so here we're looking at the four baby teeth, but what I'm actually more interested in looking at are the permanent developing adult teeth up here. We wanna make sure that all four are present. Every once in a while we come across kids with congenitally missing teeth, so they only have two or three teeth. Some people have an extra tooth right here in the middle that would later on need to be surgically removed, kind of like what we see in this picture. Do you guys see that? It's an extra tooth right here in the middle. And a lot of times having an extra thing like that, it will interfere with the proper alignment and um, how the real permanent teeth are coming in. Sometimes we see things that we don't expect. So looking at these four baby teeth, you're going to notice that one of them, this one, the root is extra short. Um, there's really no dark spots. The bone looks good. Um, most likely this child had some kind of trauma associated with that too. So we tell the parents, don't worry, but there is a good possibility that this particular baby tooth might just fall out a little bit early. Same thing with lower x-rays. Um, so again, four baby teeth, four permanent teeth. Here, this is something super, super cute. We have, a, we call this gemination, like a Gemini. So instead of having a single tooth, it's like a twin tooth. Yeah. And the reason why this x-ray is so important for this case in particular is having extra and missing teeth and the primary dentition is frequently associated with anomalies in tooth number in the permanent teeth too. Lucky for this child, all four of the permanent teeth appear to be totally normal. So only the baby teeth are affected. We got very, very lucky here. X-rays in the back. Um, these, you guys are probably familiar with these. We all get these once six months, once every 12 months, once every year, whatever. Um, so we're looking specifically at the tight areas in between the teeth to make sure that there's no decay. Um, this x-ray, we can see these dark areas in between those are cavities. And then sometimes, again, we see interesting things right here. So we have a baby molar right here. This is probably a five-year-old. The reason why I say this is because the six-year-old molars are close to coming in, but here we have an issue. This permanent tooth is actually unable to come in because the baby tooth is in the way. And what's actually really amazing is, you know, most of us look at this picture and we're like, okay, we have to pull out this baby tooth right now. But studies have actually shown that in 66% of all cases, the permanent tooth will actually find a way to kind of turn itself back and come in just the right way. So what we do is when we see this, we tell the parents, this is what's happening. Let's wait another six months and we'll take another image and see what's going on. A panoramic x-ray, um, we start taking this in, uh, we call it early mixed dentition, uh, which means that early time when you are at the stage of losing your first baby tooth and getting your first adult tooth. And uh, this x-ray, we take it once every three to five years. Um, this is more to evaluate growth and development, not really for diagnosing decay. So we look for symmetry. We wanna make sure that under every single baby tooth, there is a developing permanent tooth. So these four are the six-year-old molars. We have our 12-year-old molars in the back. 
And because of this child's young age, we don't see the wisdom teeth, which are the third set of molars quite yet. And again, sometimes we see scary things. Um, so everything looks pretty symmetrical. And what do we have here? This actually turned out to be like a pretty large tumor for this child. So. And um, so everything we talked about today um, all serve to diagnose dental issues as early as possible. So diseases can be treated when they are at the beginning stages before they lead to problems such as pain, infection, problems with eating. And we talked a little bit about this um, a few minutes ago, but specifically to children, um, so decay is not a static thing, right? It's not like, okay, you have a cavity, let's wait until three years later and then we'll treat it and still going to be a filling. That's not the way it works. Um, dental decay, it's progressive. It continues to grow. And the longer you wait, the more extensive the treatment becomes, the more expensive it becomes. And again, specific to young children, we have to start talking about sedating them with opioids, medications that might not be so great, general anesthesia. Now we're talking about intubation. We're talking about a lot of risks that we really want to avoid. So if we can get all kids to come in early, even if they have cavities, we catch them early, we treat them with non-invasive minimal procedures. We educate the parents and let them know, okay, this is what's happening. This is what we need to do to get things under control. Um, we really, I, I really want to drive home that when you guys go to your dentist, don't, don't feel intimidated. I urge all of you guys to have open and honest discussions. We are not here to judge you. We're here to empower you, educate you, give you the right tools. So together we, we become a team and you can take charge of your own and your children's dental health. So this is actually um, a photo of Dr. Cottom who's sitting here in the corner. <laughs> so hopefully we have less of these crying kids and all our patients will be like Camilla. Yes. So that's a really good question. Um, studies have shown, so they did this huge, huge study about, what was it, five, five six years ago. I want to say five years ago. So it was for kids under 11, okay? Um, they have shown that it really doesn't matter. You can use a manual toothbrush, you can use electric toothbrush, they all work the same. So it's whatever makes the kids happy. So any decent study, that's what they show. The only study that has shown electric toothbrushes to be more superior for children is, was the study done by Sonicare. So yeah, um, but, but um, that is for kids. I do believe that once uh, we are in our teens, I encourage everyone to switch to electric toothbrush simply because most of us eventually we start brushing too hard and um, gum recession, it's, it's a real problem. So for older kids, I have everyone switch to electric. So great question. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to um, give the mic to Dr. Thacker. And I'm going to introduce him real quick. Dr. Matthew Thacker is a program director for the Advanced Education in General Dentistry Residency in Henderson, Nevada, as well as our Summerlin um, Clinic. After earning his bachelor's degree in biology with a concentration in integrative physiology from UNLV, he attended UNLV School of Dental Medicine and received his doctorate in dental medicine degree in 2018. After graduating dental school, Dr. Thacker served in the U.S. Navy as a Fleet Marine Force Dental Officer. Thank you for your service. For four years um, aboard the Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center in 29 Palms, California. He continues to serve the community as a volunteer dentist for the Special Olympics Give Kids a Smile, UNLV's Sergeant Farron Memorial Veterans Clinic, Adoptive Vet Project Homeless, and Roseman University's Empower. He is passionate about providing a broad, a broad scope of evidence-based dental care yeah. to the Las Vegas Valley community and is dedicated to training the next generation of dentists to be skilled, compassionate, and service-based healthcare providers. 
Thanks, Dr. Chen. Oh, I got, I got this. I got this special one. Alrighty, slowly but surely here. Okay, awesome. I, um, okay. It's going to keep the notes here, right? All right, there we go. All right, so uh, thanks for the introduction there. Appreciate it. Um, so a little bit about me, um, graduated. Uh, my wife and I were born and raised in uh, Las Vegas. So we're, we're natives of the Valley. Um, went to UNLV for my undergraduate and for my dental school education. Um, was fortunate enough to serve with the uh, Marines for four years and uh, got to do cool stuff like do root canals on working dogs and get exposed to a lot of CS gas, a lot, like quarterly. Um, served with a lot of great um, corpsmen um, who were basically like combat medics in the military, essentially. So, um, And now I live here in Summerlin again with my wife, uh, Dr. Busso Thacker, uh, who's up here as well. So definitely way out of my league, as I'm sure all of you have already noticed. Um, and as of recently, I've, I've taken over as the clinic director and program director for our advanced education in general dentistry at Roseman University, which has been amazing. Uh, I was not anticipating going into education at all, but um, the philosophies that Roseman approaches dental care and education is something that has, hasn't aligned with me um, like it has before. So. Um, so before we talk about the newer innovations in general dentistry, we've got to kind of see where we've come from. So some interesting facts, water fluoridation was not uh, first introduced until 1944. Uh, motorized drills, the things that we drill your teeth on to get the cavities out, uh, did not come into production until the 1950s. Before then, we had foot pedals and hand cranks, and the um, little bow drill you see there is actually an archaeological discovery from 7,000 BC that they use to drill on teeth, believe it or not. Um, and dentists did not work without an assistant, with, with an assistant until the 1960s. And uh, up until 1905, we were still using cocaine as a local anesthetic. So obviously that led to a couple issues. So one of the bigger um, innovations in uh, dentistry is the invent of dental implants. You've probably heard of them. Uh, it's um, one option of many for replacing missing teeth. And it is now if you qualify and if you're an appropriate candidate, the best option. So what is a dental implant? A dental implant is basically a small titanium post that replaces the roots of a tooth. Um, this is some early examples of re uh, tooth replacement. So the one in the upper left is actually a stone tooth that was uh, discovered um, in some Honduran ruins from uh, 2,300 years ago. The upper right is uh, a discovery of an Egyptian mummy. And those teeth, uh, they determine biologically are not related to them. So they basically harvest them in something called auto transplantation from cadavers, dead people, um, and wired them to the teeth. Uh, and this, like I said, this is very early on in, uh, in our history. So uh, ever since, the dawn of civilization, we've been trying to figure out how to miss, fix these missing teeth. Um, from the 1500s to the 1800s, um, like I said, uh, teeth were actually recovered from bodies, from cadavers, 
and they would be tried to they would be introduced into the missing two socket essentially. So it sounds as gruesome as it looks. The uh, upper right is just as disturbing as it looks too. John Hunter was the first one that attempted this auto transplantation by introducing live teeth into the uh, the comb of a rooster, and they found histologically that blood vessels grew into the tooth. So yeah, it's 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 pretty intense actually. Um, early 1900s, that's when we started to see some of the implants that we know today. Um, they first were introduced as uh, orthopedic surgical screws that were placed in the bone and were placed with teeth. Um, they also experimented with uh, gold basket type um, of a, an implant that you see on the right side there, but it led to a lot of inflammation. The body would reject it usually. 1940s, the 1970s, we start to see a, something that's a little bit more familiar, something called a subperiosteal implant and a transosteal implant. So it's uh, the subperiosteal implant is basically a little cage that they put underneath the gum tissue. You can imagine without any actual integration into the bone, it didn't work very well. The transosseal implant, um, don't YouTube this if you're squeamish at all, um, is basically where they pull the skin up from the jaw and they basically screw a bunch of titanium screws to a plate and clamp it on. So it does a great job of retaining, but it's, uh, it's a little barbaric. 1940s and 1970s as well brought us the blade implant, um, which is exactly what it sounds like. They would place the blade into a narrow ridge. Problem is it didn't have all, as much stability, but it actually worked pretty well. And the 1970s to today started with this man right here, Dr. Branamark, is the one who introduced uh, two-stage titanium root form implants, which we use today. So um, it wasn't to the, in, to the introduction of titanium did modern implants actually start to take rise. And that's because for whatever reason, well, there is a reason, but I won't bore you with the details. Titanium is a metal that will fuse chemically to the bone. And so unlike gold, it's uh, biocompatible is the term we use. Um, so there's a lot of research that was done into the concept of osseointegration which is the process in which a titanium implant fuses to the bone. Um, and that brought us to the um, structures that we know today. So that is the original Branamark implant. And these are the current Branamark implants. So not a ton has changed. Um, they've done a little bit in terms of adding new surface treatments to it to make it bond better, to make it heal faster. Um, his studies involved, as sad as it is, um, fusing the bones of broken arms of uh, rabbits in basically, and saw that when, if the, if the actual bone broke again, it actually broke at the bone bone interface and not the titanium screw. So it's extremely strong. So for dental implants, um, timeline, depending on if you need a bone graft or not is anywhere from three to nine months. Implants have three separate components. They have the post that goes into the bone. They have what's called an abutment, which attaches the implant to something else. Most of the time, that's a tooth. It's a, it's a little cap, essentially. Um, but as you'll see in just a second, uh, we've created different attachments for dentures and for uh, even replacing every single tooth that's in the arch there. So implants can be used to replace um, single teeth, as you see on the bottom right, multiple teeth, as you see in a kind of a traditional bridge setup. And on the lower left, um, we can even replace the entire arch of teeth with anywhere from four to eight implants. Implant overdentures is uh, one of those applications that are pretty new. Um, so if, I, I don't know if anybody has dentures in here, but if you do or know somebody who does, you probably know that the lower denture is awful. It moves around a lot. It's hard to eat. You try to bite into a cheeseburger, you'll pull the lettuce out. It's awful. Um, and so what we've developed and realized is by placing two implants in the front of the jaw and introducing these little click attachments, there's several different types. The most common one is called a locator attachment. Um, it can retain the denture much better, lead to a better quality of life. 
Um, with the bottom denture, your chewing efficiencies, you know, in terms of percentage, 20 to 30 percent. With an overdenture, you're at like 40 ish percent. Um, natural teeth are obviously 100 percent. Um, but nope, they they click in and out, so you can kind of clean them at least and remove the little bushings that click in there. Hey, Cameron, this says that it's signed out of Zoom. Do I need to be worried about that? Hopefully not. Okay, I'm not worried about it. Um, if you've seen any commercials for Clear Choice, Teeth in a Day is what you'll hear. Um, that is the concept of an all-on, usually they'll, they'll, it'll be advertised as an all-on four prosthesis. The correct term is a fixed hybrid prosthesis because they can't always be supported on four implants. So this concept is essentially just placing anywhere from 48 implants. And then we fabricate a prosthesis that's made out of porcelain, zirconia, and metal, titanium specifically. And that is the permanent one. So that one will stay in there. Um, you still have to get routine cleanings. So as you can imagine, it's not the option for everybody. If you have any issues with dexterity, if you have any issues cleaning your own teeth, um, that's not going to be a good option. So that's why we still have the overdenture um, option. So another little example, this is a before and after. So you can see it could be pretty life-changing for a lot of people. Um, you can see here the four implants, and this is the prosthesis here. So they do an amazing job of making this look as realistic as your natural teeth, but you don't get cavities. So you don't have to put silver diamond fluoride on it. All right, so the next um, development in dentistry that's been pretty recent is computer-guided surgery. So you've probably seen this with like the, uh, when, they, when they do neurosurgery on the spine and they have the robot set up and kind of angle the drills. Very similar concept that uses GPS technology essentially to position the implants with the help of little servos or by guiding you with a little visual I'm going to show you. Um, the most common application though currently is something called a surgical guide. So it essentially is a prosthesis that we can 3D print or mill or have fabricated in another manner to help guide the implant drilled exactly where it needs to go so that there's no question about where we're placing it. So this, these are the two um, products on the market that are extremely popular. I'm gonna show you a little visual video in a second. Um, which is the, uh, the Yomi and the XNAV. Um, the Yomi, as you can see, has several servo motors that will actually place it exactly. It'll, it'll do every movement for you. The XNAV is not as guided, but it does give you a visual that shows you exactly where your hand placement needs to be. It'll give you a little green light when it's uh, in the correct position based on the planning that you've done ahead of time on the CAT scan. Let's see if this will play, maybe. Maybe it'll play on this one. Oh, maybe it will. So you can see this is the, the fake jaw right here. Calibrate it. This little thing actually sticks out of your mouth. You can see it almost looks like a QR code here. So the camera will pick that up and position it exactly where it needs to be. And so in real time, it'll uh, give you a little crosshairs. I mean, it's probably teach anybody in this room how to place an implant with this. And so while it doesn't physically guide you, with the little servos and the motors that the Yomi do, does, it uh, re leaves no room for error as long as you're following the guide. And it actually plays this really nice music. I'm just kidding, it doesn't, it doesn't at all. All right. So this is the uh, this is just a little graphic that they show that shows you the exact steps. So essentially, you put this little clip in there. You put almost like an impression material. So if you've ever had like molds of your teeth done, it's very similar to that. 
it stays in place and then you attach the little GPS QR code, enormous thing that was sticking out of the mouth on there. And then you plan the entire surgery on the computer based off of digital scans of the mouth and a CAT scan. Um, you always have to calibrate it. Um, and that's that. This is the Yomi, which is the probably cooler one, but. Um, Neosys has pioneered the first robotic assisted guidance system for dental implant surgery called Yomi. It provides dynamic planning software that can be changed at any time. Real-time visual guidance so the surgeon can confirm their progress. And physical guidance through a collaborative robotic arm. With like real-time patient tracking throughout the surgery. The procedure starts with a CT scan of the patient. The surgeon plans the surgery, accounting for key anatomical features, like the nerve, sinus, and adjacent teeth. Yomi achieves physical guidance through the use of haptic robotic technology. It physically constrains the surgeon's drill movement to match the plan. As soon as planning is complete, Yomi is immediately ready to assist the surgeon in carrying out the surgery the same day. Yomi's real-time visual guidance works like a GPS system. The surgeon always controls the drill. When the surgeon is close to the target, Yomi guides the surgeon into the precise angle and position. Yomi prevents any deviation from the plan. With full view of the surgical site, the surgeon precisely drills the osteotomy and is stopped when reaching the, the plane. The osteotomy is the hole, basically. It's this enables a, a minimally invasive, flapless approach. Which can flapless means we don't have to cut the gum. It goes right through the gum. No incision, no stitches. Through seamless integration into the surgeon's operating environment, Yomi achieves a truly digital dental workflow. Problem is, it Yomi. costs like a quarter million dollars. The other one costs thirty thousand. So. Assistance. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm work I'm working on one of them actually. So stay tuned for uh, part two. Live demonstration. One of the audience members. Just kidding. Um, one of the uh, the innovations that you probably heard of and something that we have started offering here at Roseman is same day crowns through what's called CAD CAM. So CAD CAM is not a dental specific term. Um, computer aided design, which is CAD, is exactly what it sounds like. It's using a computer to design something, whether it be uh, you know, car parts, whether it be plastic as part of like a toy or something, um, all the way to dental restorations. CAM is computer aided milling. Milling is essentially the subtractive method of taking a block of something and drilling it out of something, essentially. Uh, it'll make more sense in a second. Um, so the first step in doing same day crowns or for any kind of CAD CAM uh, workflow is intraoral scanning. So on the bottom right, we have um, the newest rendition of the iTero, which is a popular state-of-the-art intraoral scanner. So if you've ever had any molds of your mouth taken, um, you, you, kind of, you know that you'd rather do a lot of things and have those done. They're awful, they gag you, they pinch your gums. Um, with the invent of intraoral scanning, um, we eliminate almost all that. I, I don't remember the last time I took a traditional impression on a patient, everything's digital now. Even with dentures, we can take most molds of the mouth with uh, this intraoral scanning technology. Um, the designing, we have special software here that basically takes those scans, puts it in a computer, and allows us in three dimensions to fabricate the crown, the bridge, the um, prosthesis that we're making, and then milling. These are our in-office milling units. It's basically three separate accesses, three separate robotic arms um, that holds a block of porcelain and cuts it out. I'm gonna have a little video demonstration here. These are what the porcelain blocks look like. They're purple. Um, they're these basically um, blocks of porcelain. The purple is the soft stage of the porcelain. So if you ever take ceramics class in high school or college, you know that you have to take your finished product and put it in the oven, right? Same exact thing. The purple makes sure that the, once you uh, put it in the oven, it turns tooth colored, but they make it purple initially. Anybody know why? 
to make sure the dentist doesn't actually cement the, uh, the soft phase into the mouth. Um, hopefully it would stop before that actually happens. Like, hey, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, that's not the Bluetooth that I want, so. Yeah. So this is a little artistic video that somebody made. It's a little, I didn't pick the music, but this is a kind of a speeded up version of that. So that is the block of, well, that's zirconia. It's a specific type of ceramic porcelain. I don't know how they lined it up so well with the music, but. Start to see it kind of look like a little crown of ridge. Kind of looks like a violin, I guess. You can use, you can see it uses very precise movements to kind of cut the very intricate anatomy of a tooth. So what this, 12 to 15 minutes. So while all this is happening, you're in a chair. So if you've ever had a crown before, you know that it takes about two weeks before you get the final crown back, right? Usually you're in a temporary, um, which is a little acrylic, Tap that goes on while you're waiting for the permanent one. Okay, I don't know who this guy is, but he's stealing my thunder here. Well, then. Zirconia is not always better, though, so even, even though he recommends it. Um, so it eliminates that step. So the entire process takes one appointment. With a traditional crown, if you've had one, it takes two appointments usually, and you're stuck with this little um, temporary cap that's made out of acrylic, which is like fake fingernails, essentially. Um, so that means you only get have to get numb once, and it means that you don't have to come back twice. You don't have to take off work. So you can see how it's, it's, it's appealing to patients. The only bad part is you're sitting in the chair for about an hour while it's being fabricated, but most patients would prefer that over having to create a whole nother visit and get another injection. So. After that's done, we, we center it just like the ceramics class. We put it in the oven. This is the oven that we have, which is super fancy. They love, they love making these videos of dental products. I don't know why, but so it goes in there, heats it up to uh, 800 to 1,000 degrees Celsius. And so it's, uh, they're very compact. Um, it's the development of that compact nature that allowed this to be so accessible to a lot of dental offices. Oops, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, after that, we polish it, make it look nice and pretty, nice and tooth colored. Um, one of the other new inventions is 3D printing. You've probably heard of it. Um, while milling is the subtractive fabrication of a product, 3D printing is the additive method of fabricating. Um, so this has changed a lot of dental practices. There's a lot we can do with 3D printing. Um, 3D printing is just like a normal inkjet printer, which lays on a layer of ink um, in one layer to create a 2D image. 3D printing is that, but it has a third axis that builds upon that. So some of the things we can do, 3D printed dentures, we can do that all in house now without having to send it to a lab. Um, they've done an amazing job. Hello. Um, we can 3D print dental restorations now, just like we can mill them, we can actually 3D print them now out of certain dental composites. They're not as strong, so they're not indicated always. And surgical guides, like I talked about before, we can actually make these in office straight from the design software. Um, all this CAD CAM 3D printing, at the end of the day, it reduces the cost that we have to pay to um, uh, deliver this treatment. And 
ultimately that's passed down to the patient. The, the, the treatment isn't as expensive. Um, so that's another huge advantage. Because uh, generally these surgical guides are an, you know, an optional add-on to a surgery and they cost anywhere from 300 to $700 each patient that we pay. So it's, it's a lot. Um, 3D printing and oral surgery, we do a little bit of this as well, um, where you can take the CAT scans that we take at the head and actually 3D print it and pre-plan some of the surgery. So when we do bone grafting or any kind of what's called um, uh, fixation of the bone, if there's fractures and whatnot, we can actually bend these wires to the model, sterilize it and have it ready to go so we don't have to do that chair side. So it uh, reduces the surgical time, which ultimately reduces the chance of infection, complication. Um, so those are pretty cool. I have a 3D printed version of my skull on my desk. Patients love it. Um, we can also 3D print clear liner, so Invisalign, um, but I didn't want to put Invisalign on here because I didn't know if they would but get in trouble for copyright or something. Um, so we can do a lot of this in offices, a little bit more complicated. It's still ultimately a little bit more easier to send it out to a third party company like Invisalign, uh, but it is a possibility. And one of the last things, dental lasers, it's, this is still kind of a newer technology. A lot of, uh, you'll see some dental offices that just love touting that they have lasers. It's, it's great, it's uh, not, for everything though. So we do use it for certain gum surgeries. It uh, basically can help um, us approach these periodontal surgeries, which are gum surgeries in a more conservative manner. We don't have to make as big of cuts. Um, it cauterizes as we cut, so there's not as much bleeding. Um, and then some of the lower dose um, lasers. So there's different types of lasers, CO2, diode, um, some of them we use in a procedure called LANAP, which is laser assist. Um, oh my God, I always forget what the actual acronym of this is. I just called it LANAP forever. Um, yeah, I didn't write the acronym down. LANAP, laser assisted something periodontal surgery. So uh, sorry about that. Um, so we use it uh, pretty often. Some it has been shown to actually cut hard tissue as well, but it takes a long time. Um, so it's, it's not a very efficient way to actually go about it. And then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is artificial intelligence. You probably heard a little bit about it. Um, again, with that Terminator reference. Um, so the actual definition of artificial intelligence is it's, it's essentially the, the theory and it's the development of uh, computer systems to be able to perform certain tasks that, tasks that normally require a human operator. Um, so when you think about this in dentistry, it's, it's not as, uh, it's probably not as sci-fi as you, as you would anticipate. It's, it's not Yomi computer going in and placing this at the mall or, uh, or something like that. Um, it's really about um, taking some of the tasks that, that uh, dentists do in diagnosis and radiographic interpretation it takes a lot of the objective or the subjective approaches to that and creates a more objective workflow. So they've done studies and shown x-rays to five different dentists and they get five different treatment plans. They all think, you know, maybe this tooth needs to be treated, maybe this one doesn't. Um, and so with the advent of artificial intelligence, um, there's a little image on the bottom there. You can place the patient's radiographs into the computer input, and it'll identify what's a filling, what's a tooth, which tooth it is, what's an implant, um, and whether or not there, there might be decay. Again, a lot of this is still in its uh, infant stages, but with um, more powerful processors and um, graphics processing units and uh, technology every year, it becomes more and more uh, accurate. Um, luckily for us, it probably will never replace a human operator. Uh, there's just some things that need to be verified and, and seen intraorally on the patient. So, um, but it does add another layer of checks and balances when we're doing diagnosis and makes it more um, uniform and objective so that there isn't as much interpretation. Um, And that's all I got for adult dentistry. Yes, ma'am. Do wisdom teeth always have to come out or only if they're crowned? 
It's, it's about 93 to 94% of patients need them removed. There's different philosophies. The older generation of dentists, they want to take them out no matter what. Um, but nowadays we take a little bit more of a conservative approach. Most of the time they need to come out for one reason or the other. The general reason for that is the shape of the mandible. So as humans have evolved, I, if you look into like a lot of anthropology, it's very interesting. It's, I think it's when um, Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalus like started interbreeding essentially way back in the day. Um, the jaws became smaller while the teeth remained the same size. And so the third molars become impacted. They don't have any room to come out. So that's usually the reason for it. Um, despite uh, misconception, wisdom teeth actually do not cause crowding at all. Um, it, it, uh, in theory, when you think about it, you would think, yeah, yeah, the teeth are pushing, it's pushing the teeth into a crowded position, but it's actually been shown not to be true, which is great. But most of the time they need to be removed. If they aren't causing any issues, um, if they come in straight, uh, people will still end up biting their cheek a lot. A lot of times it's, it's hard to brush back there. People will get like a sensitive gag reflex and not be able to get their toothbrush back there. That's another reason we take them out. So, yes, ma'am. It's called, it's like an independent company called, I don't believe so. Yeah, this, that's that. Yeah, and they, they're, they're even creating uh, modules for root canals. So as you, as you age, um, yeah, I don't have it on here. I can definitely get back to you though. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Most, I think it is, it's like an independent company that this is their only product essentially. Um, but, um, you know, that's how CAD cam used to be like same day crowns. That's how, um, Cone beam, computer topography, CBCTs, which are basically CAT scans for your head. That's what that used to be. But as the technology has advanced, it's become more affordable and we're able to have it in office. So, you know, even in, in Vegas currently, if you go to a dental office, the chance of them having a CBCT in office is very low. You usually have to go to Desert Radiology, Steinberg, something like that. Um, at Roseman, we have one in each clinic. So um, if you come to us for dental treatment, we have pretty much everything except for the Yomi. I'm working on it, slowly but surely. Yes, XNAB is, is built by Nobel. That's the cheaper one. So I'm working on the budget friendly one. Back up a little bit. You know, what is the indication for dental implants, either single or total? Um, the indication is, is quite simply any missing tooth at all. Not everybody is a candidate for it. So if there's, if patients, don't have good oral hygiene. If you don't brush your teeth, implants can get inflamed and can get gingivitis or periodontal disease. It's called something different for implants, just like regular teeth. So that would be a uh, contraindication, which is basically a reason we can't do it. Certain systemic diseases. So if you have certain uh, bone diseases like osteoporosis or um, Paget's disease, and you're being treated with a bisphosphonate, um, which is a medication that's used to treat that, that would be a reason we can't do it. If you're a heavy smoker, can't do it. It's lead to it has been shown to lead to failure of dental implants uh, statistically. Um, but in general, with the different treatment modalities we have now, it can be used to replace anywhere from one to all 28 to 32 teeth, basically. Um, so the first step when we evaluate somebody for implants is we take that CBCT, that CAT scan of the head, and we determine if there's enough bone for us to actually put a screw there. If there isn't, that doesn't necessarily preclude you. We can definitely do something called lateral ridge augmentation, vertical ridge augmentation, which is basically a bone graft where we grow the bone. It's a little bit more um, time intensive. It, it take it add tax on anywhere from three months to a year for that treatment. Um, but if you're using, if you've had dentures for a long time, you you probably realize it's uh, it's well worth it and well worth the uh, procedures. So. Yes. So the success rate though, um, you know, dental implants have, becoming, have been pretty popular. They ramped up in popularity in like the 80s, 90s. 
So the studies we have are not necessarily long-term studies, but some of the newer 20, 30 year studies are showing a success rate of 94 to 97%. So they're, they're very, very predictable. Um, there's, it's the same risk as any oral surgery, which is infection. Um, uh, the body can technically refuse the implant, um, but it is very biocompatible. Most of the time when the, when the implants fail, um, it's usually patient related, it's usually hygiene or smoking or, uh, not following post-op instructions. Um, yeah. All right, so um, we do have two clinics. We have one in Henderson, one in Summerlin. We're offering adult care at both. Um, and so, oh, yes, sir. We're working on it. We're, we're, there's a lot of research that's being put, put into dental pulp stem cells. Um, it's, it scares dentists everywhere. No, I'm just kidding. You can still get cavities on stem cell generated teeth, but yeah. But the genetic component to the generation of teeth is very complex. It's still being studied. There's essentially waves of different um, molecules that are like signal molecules that will determine the shape of the teeth based on whether it's coming from the front or the back. That's why you look at like premolars and they look like tiny molars. And then as you go towards the front, they start to become more like incisor shaped. Uh, and that's because of that, um, the concentrations of those molecules. It's, it's pretty cool for, for me, I guess, but. But implants are awesome though, so <laughs> I like them. Um, but let me put up the slide here. If you wanna grab a picture of it, um, we currently are accepting new patients. We take pretty much every insurance. We take people with no insurance, um, regardless our prices are significantly lower, minimum 50% lower than the outside companies. The advantage here is um, we don't really have a financial motivation. Um, we're a teaching facility, so my residents are all licensed dentists that have decided to do an extra year of training to become more competent and learn more advanced procedures. And so you're, it's not like if you go to a, 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 a dental school, an undergraduate dental school, you're going to be seeing a student that just failed their head and neck anatomy exam, and now they're giving you an injection. So um, we, all the materials we use are top of the line. The implants we use are the most expensive and top of the line implants on the market. So more than likely, I would guess you're, you're getting better care than you would any place else. So um, that's our phone number there. Um, yeah. Yes. Yep. If it's something advanced where it, requ it requires like a um, open reduction and or maxillomandibular uh, fixation, like having your, your jaw wired shut, uh, we, we just don't have the capability to do that, so we'll refer you to an oral surgeon, but hopefully you're going to an emergency room and not a dental office if that's happening, if your jaw's broken. So, But you'd be surprised. When I worked with the Marines, they came in with all kinds of crazy stuff. Nope, they'll give you an antibiotic and a narcotic. No offense to any physicians out there, sorry. But... <laughs> Uh, for like gum surgery, um, we don't have a specialist, but I I do a lot of the gingival surgery at the clinic. Um, so I've taken a lot of advanced training. Just I, I love every aspect of dentistry except for pediatrics. Sorry. Um, the which one? The Lanap. That's the, um, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's, uh, yes, the, it's like a tunnel technique. So we use that for certain indications. So if you are a patient that has more triangular shaped teeth and your papilla, which is the gum tissue between the teeth is like super sharp, 
we use that so that we don't have to cut the papilla away. It's a more conservative technique. So it's, we do use it if it's indicated, it's rarely indicated. Um, yes, it does. If it does, if you're, if the person doing it is trained. But you know what's really funny about people? So if you said to say, Chinese guy, no, like Dr. Chow. Right. Dr. Chow is not a periodontist. He's a dental dentist. So a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, it's in certain circumstances yes it's just um it, it's less invasive um, but you also have less visibility so there's there's kind of a trade-off so that's why it's only really indicated for uh front teeth back teeth you you don't have that visibility on top of it um it so it's the the provider the the surgeon's visibility so we actually have to be able to access that area pretty well and in the back we have to retract the cheek and use what's called indirect vision with a mirror to actually feed that through um yeah but we do a exactly so we but we do an actual flap so we take a scalpel and we actually i don't know how to say this without it sounding bad we peel the gums away to expose the bones, so we have direct visualization. So there isn't. An... Yes, yeah, definitely. No, good question. Are you a periodontist or something? Is that what you're? No. That's like a periodontist question. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is working as long as the person doing it is trained to do it and didn't just take like a two-day course in it or something. So, yeah, you'd be surprised. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. You, there's YouTube, so. Yeah, yes, sir. I did on the Marine working canines. So with the, the military pays a lot of money to train these canines, anywhere from twenty five to fifty thousand dollars to train one of these dogs. And I love dogs. I got my own dogs, Puka and Boa, a little Maltese and Poodle. but. For the military, these dogs are only useful, they got their teeth if, for that particular purpose. And so oftentimes they will fracture these canines and without their canines, they, they are effectively useless for the military and they would just be adopted out. But um, we are able to fabricate um, titanium crowns that go on there after doing the root canal. Um, veterinary dentistry is generally a specialty of veterinary medicine. But in this particular circumstance, um, I was the only person there essentially um, that was very confident with root canal, do a lot of root canals. And the vet that was there had no training in it. So I would go in there, do the root canal, some extractions, um, and then we could fabricate a titanium crate. It looks really cool. Uh, not in a day. These ones take a little, these ones take a little, uh, a little while. Hold on. I got. I just have to show you the picture. It's just super cool. I do. Oh, I do in the clinic, but I have a. So. So we will actually fabricate these. Let me see if I. So they look like way cooler. So um, I had the, there was one time that I was I was um, observing one dog that we had worked on, and it had just like come out of general anesthesia, and it was, started walking towards its friends, and all the dogs were like looking at the dog's mouth because it had this shiny titanium. But I mean, if it wasn't like animal cruelty, I'd say let's do this on all of them because it looks like way more scarier. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's what we do with, uh, so yeah, I, I had that opportunity there in Nevada, you human dentists can still work on dogs, but you have to be under the supervision of a, a doctor of veterinary medicine. Um, but there's a couple good specialists in town that are vets that are specialized in uh, dentistry, which is a much better option than um, us because the, the, the teeth are longer. So a normal human canine is 
25 to 30 millimeters. For a dog canine, it's 60 to 70 millimeters. And so I had to um, kind of fashion the files together. I had to like actually like, um, like solder them together to make it like work because we, the military wouldn't let me buy special files because dentistry is not a top priority for the military. So, unfortunately. So, awesome. But yeah, please come visit us. Um, we'll, our number, if you didn't get it already, I'll just put it up again. But thank you all for coming out. I appreciate it. Huh? Oh, let me put my, my PowerPoint. Oh, I put them right next to Angelica. Oh, okay. So maybe I'll have to put them Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you want? Oh, you haven't seen the clinic yet, have you? Yes. Yeah. 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 I know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And we got you. We got you scheduled again, right? see my husband next time oh good 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 yeah yeah so it's kind of a gap in our treatment but uh once march comes along we'll be back in uh back and ready to go yeah absolutely see and like i told you i have the entire filipino population of las vegas oh i can give you a lot see exactly you're supposed to be doing that this is my wife angelica <laughs> cool awesome well Cool, cool. Hopefully it didn't scare you too much. Right? <laughs> cool, nice to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Ingat. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here's a natural tooth from here you come. And 